Um, so um, I'm presenting today work I did as my MSc thesis, and um, um, contrary to what you just introduced me, I do not hold a doctor title <laughs> just yet, but um, <laughs> we'll keep that on. So um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the, uh, my short presentation about uh, automatic kernel code generation for a focal plane sensor processing devices. Um, which was done by me at Imperial, uh, my time at Imperial College and supervised by Paul Kelly, who is um, visiting us today as well. Um, so this work is mainly based on a device developed by um, Professor Pieter Dudek at the University of Manchester. Um, and we were grateful for him for doing that to make this work possible. Now, traditional cameras like the one you have on your phone produce images that are meant to be looked at by humans. So they make sure that the colors are accurate, that the resolution is as high as possible, that you have high dynamic range and these things. But it doesn't necessarily mean that these pictures are good to be evaluated by a computer algorithm. For example, if you talk about real-time applications, we often talk about, let's say, 30 frames per second. But this is a very human-centric approach because this barrier at 30 frames per second doesn't mean a lot to a computer. So um, how do we get faster frame rates and how do we use less energy by doing so? And what we set out, well, what we used was this, um, this device that I mentioned before, developed uh, at the University of Manchester, which is called this CAMP5 Focal Processing Array. And it's essentially an array of 256 by 256 processors on a grid. And every processor does have a little light sensor embedded into it. So that means you can take pictures right as the processor when you mount the lens on top of it. Now, Every one of these processors is very, very simple and only implemented with about 170 transistors. So it's extremely simple. So this also limits the things we can do with it. For example, we only have seven registers available per processor. Um, and these registers sort of values as analog currents instead of um, digital values and flip-flops. Also, computations are done directly on the bus by just physically um, putting together two currents to add them up together. Um, so we can do addition, it's very easy, but there's no hardware support for any multiplication of any kind. There's also no um, direct memory access to the whole array, so um, the only communication that's possible is between the four neighbors of every, of every processor. There's also no possibility to spill into global memory, it's just really the seven registers you have to work with. Um, the instruction sets are very basic, so what we can do is we can shift images in the x-direction by just taking the value from the neighboring processor over and over again. We can do the same in the y-direction. Um, we can easily add images together, we can subtract images from each other. Um, there's an instruction to scale images by one half by basically sending the current into two registers at the same time. Um, yeah, so what we set out to do is to um, build basically a compiler that can generate code to um, run convolutional image filters right on this device. Um, and yeah, convolutional image filters are basic building blocks for many computer vision algorithms, such as uh, Viola Jones face detection or um, also convolutional neural networks. Basically, every computer vision algorithm has some sort of filtering in there at some, po at some point. Now, this device gives us the potential to um, do this with much less power and at a much higher frame rate, so in the order of thousands of frames per second. Um, so this is the motivating example. This is the uh, filtering time for a simple single image on both a CPU and GPU using the OpenCV implementation versus a R code on a, on this on this sensor device down here. So it's uh, orders of magnitude faster. Um, so how do we do this? Well, as I said, there's no possibility for any multiplication on this device. So we have to um, simulate everything using additions and subtractions as well as shifts of the values around of the array. So there are easy filters like this box filter up here or this uh, um, Sobel edge detection filter um, where we only have integers in the filter kernel. So this is fine. We can easily do this by just adding the numbers together. There are more complicated ones like this one, um, but it's still fine because all the values are powers of two. So we can just um, use the division by two um, instruction on the device to, uh, to, to get these numbers. Now there are even more complicated filters like that one. It's basically random floating point values. Um, and we do this by approximation. So we basically approximate these values um, by, by sums of powers of two. So we essentially just multiply um, the whole array with a power of two and we correct then the factor here and we round to the nearest um, integer in here. 
So this obviously introduces a approximation error, which gets bigger the, the less approximation you do, so the less deep you go. Um, and this is the, uh, the theoretical approximation, best approximation error we can achieve for values from zero to one. Um, so it, it's quite okay if, we, if you go down deep enough, if you approximate to a, to a certain value. Um, right. Now, these convolutional filters often have very rep repetitive terms in them. And especially if you apply the filter on the whole image at the same time using massive parallelism, which is what we do, then we often have um, lots of repeated um, terms in, in the computation we can reuse. And especially since we are um, doing this um, approximation thing with the addition of subterms in order to approximate multiplications, we can reuse even more terms in this, in this process. So there's really a lot of opportunity for reuse. As a motivating example again, so this is a five by five box filter up here, um, an unscaled one. And you can see here is the uh, computational graph that our, that our method produced for this, um, for this filter on the device. So we start on the right and on the left hand side up here uh, with the initial state. So this is basically the initial state is as if we had done an identity filter. So it's just a one in the middle. Then we take the value from the left hand processor. So we're, we always, we're always looking at the processor in the middle. Now we take the value from the processor to the left of us and store it in another register, which is then as if we had applied this filter down here. Um, then we add the two, the two images together and we end up with this here. Now we reuse this sub-result, we still have an register to create this, then we add them together, we reuse this sub-result to do this, and then we add them together to get this center line. And the whole process is then just repeated up down here for the other dimension. Now, this whole, the whole program is outlined down here and there's just 14 instructions, which is quite cool because the whole filter sums up 25 values in 14 instructions. And these 14 instructions not only do it for a single pixel, but they do it on the whole array. So applying a filter on the whole image is really just 14 instructions. Um, so how do we do this? Well, the magic behind the method lies in a, in a representation of the filter we do in a set notation. So at first, we make sure that we don't have any fractions in the, in, in the matrix. So we take all the fractions out using the method stated before, um, so that we only have integers down here. Then we create a, a set, which is a multi-set, so we have repeated elements in there. And for every coordinate location in the, in the matrix, we create a representant in the, in the set. So for example, for the one, we create one element at minus one zero. That means we have a one at coordinates minus one zero. We create four representants for this, um, for this coordinate here, which is zero, zero, this, this one. And then one again for the coordinate one, zero. We do the same for the initial state, which is just an identity filter. And we have then eight representatives for the, for the center pixel here, which goes this. Then what our method does, it tries to find a plan on how to transform this, which is the state before any filter application, to this, which is the desired state in the end. And our, our tools we, we can use to go from the top one to the bottom one is essentially the instruction set of our processor. So we mapped all the instructions of the processor to transformations on these sets. For example, oh, that doesn't look very good. But, um, so this should outline a shift um, transformation. So um, this, this should be a um, one minus one, which should stand down here. But basically, um, we, trans we shift this set here, um, one pixel to the right and one pixel down, and this results in a new set, which is then one minus one and three three. Um, we can do, uh, we, we, map, we also map the scaling, so the division by two. So if we divide this set by two, we essentially just eliminate all half of the, of the representatives that they record in. Um, and then additions are generally just the union of the two sets. Now we used a, a recursive algorithm that starts with the, with the end product, with the final set, and um, tries to find splits of these sets um, until it reaches this, this initial state down here. Now, we require, so we, in every step, we split the sets into three parts, A, B, and R, and we require the sets A and B to be transformable into each other. Transformable means that we know how to generate A from B. Therefore, in every step, it is enough 
to carry on with B and R, and we don't really have to care about A as we then know how to generate A from B. And this then sort of eliminates more and more representatives until we end up with, with just the ones at zero in, in the initial state. Um, so this yields a very, very, very large uh, storage space, which we want to, to uh, prune. And we, we do that by, tree, um, by cutting off branches of the tree, which would result in um, sub-results that use more registers than the device actually has, because these programs will not be feasible on the device anyway. Now, this is very, very effective, as our device only has seven registers, I can imagine. <laughs> Um, yeah, so then we also prune results that yield, that we already know yield worse results than, than, than the best one already found. And we also use static analysis to evaluate um, certain decisions, um, to, to evaluate the splits based on a heuristic on how likely they are to be producing good, good results. Um, so for example, as an example, we have this filter up here, 1.51, and this yields this computational tree up here. And basically every node represents a sub-result. So every node represents a value we come up with, and then we kind of add them together. And this yields the, uh, the program with uh, generalized register names, so there's no register allocation then yet. Um, we do another technique called a graph, we call graph relaxation. It's essentially the same technique as a retiming known from uh, integrated circuit design, which has found great adoption in, in industry as well. Um, so what this technique does in, in the integrated circuit world, it moves latches around in the computational graph in order to minimize the length of the critical path in the, in the RTL design. Whereas for us, we um, kind of move the computations around to different locations on the chip. So we move them to different processors to minimize the data movements on the, on the chip. And this often yields slightly better results than um, than, yeah, if we didn't do it. So for example, in our example here, we, um, yeah, we eliminated this shift here, one shift here, um, but then we had to, in, and we, and one shift here, but then we had to introduce one shift here. So we, we, we got rid of three shifts, but we had to in, introduce one more, but we still saved two within this, this result. In here. So as the last step, we do a register allocation on this using a standard graph coloring um, algorithm. Um, this is nothing special. And we end up with a code that is directly executable on the device. Um, and yeah, that doesn't need any further modification from the user. Um, so a couple of words on the evaluation on this. So this is, um, the, this is a fully heuristic search. This is the red line. And this one is a, a fully exhaustive search. So that shows that our heuristic actually helps, them, helps the algorithm to find the optimal solution of eight instructions almost immediately, whereas the heuristic one takes about 20 seconds uh, mean. Also, um, the filters perform very, very well. So um, the scamp one is, is the gray one, so it's that little dot down here. And this is evaluated on a set of well-known filters, on Gaussian filters, Sobel, Laplace, and Sharpen filters. Um, yeah, so this has to be taken with a little bit of grain of salt because the, um, our device uh, operates in analog fashion. So that means every computation adds a bit of noise to the result. So the results are more noisy than the ones um, produced on the, on the GPU and CPU. But still, the performance gains are, 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 are substantial. And they do not come from the analog operation of the device. They do come from the structure and, and the arrangement of the processors in, in the chip. Um, so we implemented a simple seven-stage viola joint face detector on this. And we did a much more naive approach than the original viola Jones paper. So they used the integral image to basically um, do sums of images in static time, whereas we just basically sum up all the values um, um, naively. But even so, um, we achieve almost the same performance as the CPU, but keep in mind that the CPA runs, that our device runs at 10 megahertz versus the CPU runs at multiple gigahertz and it's still kind of in the same order of magnitude um, using a much less sophisticated approach. And at the same time, it uses much less energy than, than the CPU does or any GPU does. Um, so to conclude, um, yeah, convolutions are a key building blocks for many um, um, computer vision algorithms. And it's interesting to see how much we can do with very, very simple hardware and the right software tools to then use this hardware to the best extent. 
So there is work going on on trying to do um, um, convolutional networks on this to do object detection um, at higher frame rates. Um, yeah, so that's it. And then, um, well, near camera processing is probably the only way we have if we want to achieve near biological performance in, in computer system and computer vision pipelines. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>